Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to topic 3.5.4, Nutrient Cycles from the AQA A-Level Biology Specification. As always, let's start with a look at our specification. Nutrients are recycled within natural ecosystems, and examples of this happening include the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, which are the two cycles we need to know about. So the spec wants us to know about the role of sap probionts in decomposition, as well as how mycorrhizae help plants with the uptake of water and inorganic ions. We should also know the role of bacteria in the nitrogen cycle to illustrate the processes of saprobiotic nutrition, ammonification, nitrification, nitrogen fixation, and denitrification. Note that you don't need to know the names of individual species of bacteria. We will then finish by covering natural and artificial fertilizers, as well as environmental issues arising from the use of fertilizers, including leaching and eutrophication. So if we follow the spec closely, we can see that it wants us to know the nitrogen cycle in more detail in terms of the bacteria involved in each stage. Whereas it just wants us to be familiar with the phosphorus cycle, i.e. we don't need to go into as much detail for this cycle. So let's start by having a look at the role of microorganisms in nutrient cycles. Nutrient cycles rely on saprobionts to break down organic molecules into simple inorganic molecules and ions, which plants can make use of. Now, saprobionts are microorganisms, such as bacteria and fungi, that live on detritus. They feed by extracellular digestion. How does extracellular digestion work? Well, first the saprobionts secrete digestive enzymes, then they absorb the soluble nutrients released. Overall, they convert organic into inorganic compounds. For example, saprobionts may convert larger organic molecules like DNA, RNA, amino acids, proteins, and urea into smaller inorganic ions and molecules like phosphates and nitrates. Note that detritivores are organisms which break larger pieces of detritus, like big leaves for example, into smaller pieces. This increases the surface area for saprobionts to act upon, increasing the rate of decomposition. So let's start with the nitrogen cycle, which we need to know in a bit more detail. So if we begin with plants and animals, these contain nitrogen in the form of nitrogen containing organic compounds, like proteins, nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA. When these die, the organisms, or excretions like urea and feces, undergo decomposition by saprobionts. This process is known as ammonification, as it produces ammonium NH4 plus ions. These undergo a process called nitrification, which involves ammonium ions being converted first to nitrite, NO2 minus, then nitrate, NO3 minus ions. This is done in aerobic conditions by nitrifying bacteria. Aerobic conditions are important as the nitrifying bacteria need oxygen for nitrification, which is an oxidation process, and also to be able to aerobically respire themselves. The nitrate ions then may be taken in by active transport into the root hair cells of plants, a process known as assimilation and the plant then uses these ions to build new nitrogen-containing organic molecules. The nitrate ions may also be converted to nitrogen gas in a process known as denitrification. This is done by denitrifying bacteria and occurs in anaerobic conditions like waterlogged soils. The nitrogen gas goes into the atmosphere. Atmospheric nitrogen gas can be converted back into ammonium by nitrogen-fixing bacteria which live in the soil or the root nodules of leguminous plants. Next we have the phosphorus cycle. The process of weathering may introduce inorganic phosphate ions into waterways like rivers. Rivers then flow into the sea, resulting in phosphate ions accumulating in the sea. These then can become stored in sedimentary rock as it builds up at the bottom of the sea. Tectonic plate movement can result in phosphate ions being moved upwards towards higher areas and soil again, where weathering occurs, which then results in the process being repeated. Note that phosphate ions can also be absorbed into the root hair cells of plants by active transport, which, like in the nitrogen cycle, is called assimilation. Animals may then feed on the plants. 
plants and animals decompose, facilitated by saprobionts, which returns phosphate ions back into the soil. We also need to know about mycorrhizae, which are fungi that associate with the roots of plants. They're a bit like extensions to the roots, like extending fingers. They grow in and around the root system, increasing the surface area for the absorption of water and mineral ions. Mycorrhizae form a mutualistic relationship with a plant. Note that a mutualistic relationship is one where both species that are involved benefit from the interaction. In the case of mycorrhizae and plants, the mycorrhizae help the plant by growing in and around the root system and increasing the surface area for the absorption of water and mineral ions. The mycorrhizae in exchange receive sugars such as glucose from the plant. You can see it here on the diagram a bit more clearly. We can compare these two plants, one without and one with mycorrhizae growing in and around the root system. The one with mycorrhizae, you can see that there is a much bigger surface area covered. You could say the mycorrhizae increase the size of the mineral depletion zone. Then we have fertilizers. Crops take in mineral ions from the soil and use them to build their own tissues. When they're harvested, this means no mineral ions are returned to the soil, as the crops don't die and decompose there, i.e. no phosphate or nitrate ions are returned to the soil by saprobionts. So we need fertilizers to replace the lost mineral ions. There are two types of fertilizer, natural and artificial. Natural fertilizers include organic matter such as manure, dead and decaying remains of plants, animals and slurry. Artificial fertilizers are pure, inorganic ions blended together to give the appropriate balance of mineral ions for a particular crop. At this point it would be useful to consider why mineral ions are needed in the first place. Here we have some examples. Nitrate ions are needed for protein synthesis, ATP synthesis and nucleic acids. Phosphate ions are also needed for ATP synthesis and nucleic acids. Potassium ions are important for stomatal regulation, and sulfate ions are useful in some amino acids which have sulfur-containing R groups, which can then be used to form disulfide bridges that are important in the tertiary structure of some proteins. Note that because of the importance of these different mineral ions for plants, many artificial fertilizers have a blend of nitrate, phosphate, and potassium ions. Hence, you might have heard the term NPK fertilizer. Finally, we need to cover leaching and eutrophication. Leaching is the loss of soluble substances, such as nitrate and phosphate ions, from the top layer of the soil when water drains through. Note that leaching is more likely to occur if fertilizer is applied just before heavy rainfall, as there hasn't been enough time for plants to take in ions into their roots by active transport, meaning that there are free mineral ions in the soil which can be washed away. Also, when you apply too much fertilizer, we have the same principle. We may have excess fertilizer, which is prone to leaching, as there hasn't been enough time for plants to absorb them. In eutrophication, we first have the leaching of excess mineral ions from fertilizer into waterways. This results in an increase in the concentration of mineral ions in these waterways, stimulating the rapid growth of algae and ponds and rivers. This results in something called algal bloom. Here the algae grow rapidly, blocking sunlight from reaching plants below. The plants cannot photosynthesize, meaning that they die. Bacteria feed on the dead plant matter and decompose it, whilst carrying out aerobic respiration. The bacteria hereby use up oxygen, meaning that the concentration of oxygen in the water decreases. Fish and other organisms die because not enough oxygen is available. These organisms are then also decomposed by bacteria, which uses up even more oxygen, and so we have a vicious oxygen depleting cycle, resulting in the death of the ecosystem. Great, so that would be nutrient cycles covered. We've had a look at the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, the action of saprobionts in decomposition, as well as how they are involved in various stages in the nitrogen cycle in particular. We've covered mycorrhizae and how they form a mutualistic relationship with plants. We have covered natural and artificial fertilizers and how they replace lost mineral ions. 
Finally, we considered environmental issues arising from the use of fertilisers and how they can result in leaching and eutrophication. That would be it for now guys, thanks for watching, please subscribe, comment, next time we'll be covering survival and response.